Global Clinicians. This is Ali Nasser, and I'm joined today by our own faculty, Dr. John Gaddy. John, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. John is here to do a case review with, uh, with us. And uh, John, why don't we go ahead and talk about the first case you have for us? Yeah, the first case, uh, this 65-year-old uh, lady presented with some pain uh, upon chewing, uh, swelling. Uh, she also had swelling uh, on the lingual aspect, and uh, we did probe it, and it probed about four millimeters. In that area. So we've got area. a premolar here that's had a previous root canal and a crown, and you have a patient that has got some swelling and is sensitive to percussion and palpation on this tooth. Yeah, and you'll look on the buckle. It doesn't look too swollen, but then when you see the, the lingual, you can tell where the swelling's coming from. Yeah, so this is an occlusal, occlusal view of the tooth that has the crown, and you can see that on the lingual area, there is uh, some bogginess and the, there is some uh, deterioration in the tissue, and it was probing it a little bit deep too, right? Yeah. About five millimeters Four to so. five millimeters, yes. And then a little bit of bleeding and pump probing is in two. So there was also some uh, movement in the crown, correct? correct? Yes, okay. correct. And, and so that's when we, we decided to retreat this case and when we made initial access, the crown started to move. Yeah. And, and ultimately, uh, this is what we saw. So basically, uh, upon access, you found out that the movement wasn't because of a loose crown. It was actually a piece of the tooth shear. that had a shear fracture yes. towards the lingual explaining also the reason why there was some bleeding on the lingual. So these kinds of cracks, usually the uh, type of uh, uh, inflammation you see on the, on, in the tissue is oftentimes due to either caries underneath the crown so that the, there's you know, decay underneath there or due to crack. So that rim of inflammation is actually due to bacteria living in the crack and causing irritation and, and breakdown in the tissue. So at this point, this is what you were left with. There's not a whole lot of uh, tooth in there. No, there isn't. And, yeah. and, and even on the mobility, it, it was pretty tight in there. So the, they, even though they're fractured, they hang in there pretty, pretty strong. Yeah. So. No, absolutely. Yeah. Once you remove the tissue, the underlying uh, area is healthy. It doesn't really have a, a, any periodontal problem. So the tooth can be saved provided there is enough clinical crown or coronal structure so that you can biomechanically retain the, the ensuing restoration here. So I would assume then you explained to the patient that in order to save this tooth, you would need a crown lengthening and all kinds of stuff. And at this point, what did the patient uh, yeah, want to do? We discussed that and she wanted to try to save the tooth at all costs um, and uh, just to see if there was, uh, if she could maintain what she had without having to go to extensive procedures. Yeah. Yeah, so at this point, it's basically the patient's choice if they want to try to keep the tooth or not. And uh, occlusion is an important part of this uh, this treatment planning decision making. So on somebody who Absolutely. has group function is putting a lot of pressure on a tooth like this, obviously would not be maybe a good candidate. But, but um, she didn't in this case. But she didn't. She no. had a canine rise occlusion, which means that, you know, in a, in a situation like that, then when the tooth is not going to get that much um, of a biomechanical load, if the patient doesn't have group function, is not a bruxer, and the occlusion is fairly light, and this is an uh, elderly patient, so, you know, uh, it would be a good decision-making scenario and trying to, um, to to see if you can save the two. So you went in there, there was amalgam in the axis opening here, right. and then you removed it and you got down to the composite, uh, to, to the gutta percha and it. And as you see, as we start to uh, disassemble and take out the gutta percha, we, we, we form them into one canal, um, which is, as we know, it's the wine classification. Yeah, one class, uh, classification, two type canal anatomy. Your two uh, canals are forming into one. And at this point, what happens? You're just hitting a solid stop, right? Yeah, I'm hitting a solid stop because we wanted to just fully retreat this and not even think about surgery other than the crown lengthening we needed to right. do. Um, but for, for whatever reason, we couldn't get past this, uh, this point. Yeah, so at this point then, you proceed to then restore the tooth putting your posts and core in there. It's the matching and the sequence uh, post material and the core material. So you bonded the, um, um, your the post, post into place. It's a prefabricated um, uh, fiber post. And then you proceed to do your crown lengthening. And since the tooth probably remained sensitive still a little bit to percussion, at this point you're doing your uh, apico at the same time. Yeah, we, we elected to do the apico because at the time when we had to go in surgically to do the crown lengthening and she was uh, uh, percussive sensitive, I didn't want to run into a situation where we do this case the crown and, and then it fails and then apically. It fail yeah. and her have symptoms. Yeah, exactly. So it's a good idea to just be on the uh, 
to be sure, since you weren't able to do the non-surgical retreatment uh, as you wanted uh, fully, therefore, it, it, it is a logical choice. As you can see here, there is actually a fairly good amount of ferrule around this tooth. Um, and so you do the crown lengthening here, and uh, you are... Uh, you have yourself a good amount of dentin, and then you proceed to do the apicoectomy. Here's your um, osteotomy, and you can see the apex with the filling there at the end. So here's we used our uh, ultrasonic to get the retro preparation. I would like to get a little larger preparation in the um, at the apex, but we were we were uh, up against some type of hard material. Yeah. You know. So, but by larger, you mean a little bit deeper to go in as deep deeper as you can, Deeper and right? a, little wider, a little wider diameter, yes. Yeah, I mean, obviously here you're using the lid technique, right? So yes. the lid technique and, and, and uh, meaning that you're injecting the biceramic uh And then we just uh, put a flowable. little cover of uh, the... And a cover of the putty material over it. Uh, it means that, you know, your preparation is done first by... Um, you know, getting the, the head of the ultrasonic down to the end, but then it has to be wide enough for the, uh, the, the, tip, you know, of the, the tip of the injection correct. needle to get yes. all the way down too. So that's an important thing. So here, you know, you... And you can see here, I don't quite have the opening I wanted no, to, um, to... To get that, uh, that length down. So then you've injected and then you place your putty in there and uh, um, there is a little bit of um, um, a flash on the side that it's easy to clean using a little spoon or you can even hydrocarbon using a little bit of a, uh, mm -hmm. water. Water, and it comes out easily and that looks like a nice seal there right at the apex and then you place what have you placed here we put a, a demineralized bone in there uh, and we cover it with a, a resorbable membrane okay and then uh, do your suturing here as I can see and uh, then basically the healing and so on and this is your final uh, radiograph showing the tooth has got the uh, the post in there and the core material and a little apicoectomy yeah. down at the end of and the And you can see how well. the post matches right at the, the gut aperture point. Yeah, so exactly. So pretty nice job of keeping this tooth for this patient. So having uh, now going a little bit deeper, getting a better grasp, creating a better ferrule through the proper crown lengthening procedure can help ward these things off. A lot of times the crown lengthening is a procedure that would help in cases like this. And it could be done very effectively. And we have a fairly, fairly long route here as well. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's the critical part of it, yeah. is when you have a long route, it does help. And also when you don't have a very high frication on the adjacent molar, then it, it, is, it will work out. And here it is, the, uh, the case after the healing and uh, the prep, and the tooth is ready to be restored. Terrific. So I think, uh, you know, this, this case came out uh, very good, and this patient, I'm sure, is very happy to, to, to keep this tooth. And uh, this has been in there now for a while, you were telling me, and the tooth patients have no symptoms and everything is healing very well. Terrific. Well, thank you for sharing this case with, uh, with our audience. For We Will Then Know, I'm Ali Nisei. I'm John Gatti. And we hope you found this information helpful.